one. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the MSNS podcast. My name is Ryan Lim. I will be your host. And with me today is a very, 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 very special guest, Nathan Chu. Yeah, you know, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> he was uh, he was formerly on our uh, MSNS e-board last year as our secretary. And now he has, you know, graduated and moved on to new, bigger and better things. Welcome, Nathan Chu. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, everyone. My name's Nathan. Uh, like Ryan said, I was the secretary for MSNS from 2018 to 2020, and uh, I'm a new graduate nurse from USF. So, yes. yeah. so how, like, first off, how are you doing, you know, during all this crazy stuff? Like, how are you doing right now? Yeah, uh, I'm doing all right. I'm just trying to stay busy, um, trying to, you know, keep myself kind of healthy during this time, oh, yeah. uh, just because I am working on a unit where we are getting some COVID patients now. Um, so, I mean, I'm fortunately I'm not working directly with them right now, but uh, just the fact that they're on the unit, it can be a little uh, concerning at times. Right? Yeah, I, I can imagine. And before we like kind of get into that and touch on that topic, I wanted to kind of backtrack and talk about like how you got there to your current job right now, because you're in Washington right now, correct? Right, right. I'm yeah. in Washington. Yeah. How did that all happen? Because from my understanding, you know, you you were in the Bay Area even before USF, and then you were at USF, and then that, I feel like that's a huge transition for anybody to go, you know, move from there all the way to Washington. Like, what was your thought process mm -hmm. behind that? Yeah. So actually, when I was looking at uh, nursing programs uh, in senior year of high school, I was looking also at Seattle University because they have a four-year BSN program as well. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, actually really liked the city of Seattle and always saw it as like a possibility of me going there. Um, but just with USS reputation and it being close to home and me just um, loving being near family, um, I chose USF, right? Yeah. And, uh, but I always said in the back of my head, like, okay, um, maybe once I graduate, then I'll go to Seattle, right? Or maybe if I want to go back to um, graduate school and I'll try and find something near Washington, right? And then it was just kind of always in the back of my head. And I didn't actually think it was going to happen, though. That's, that's um, awesome. But when I graduated, yeah, yeah. But when I graduated, um, this whole pandemic thing is happening with COVID and uh that kind of led to the competition being even higher for um, job positions in California. And then, so I said, hey, maybe uh, it is time for a change. And uh, so that's how I was looking in Washington, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about Washington kind of attracted you there? Like, have mm -hmm. you ever been there or was it something that you kind of just like looked through online and were like, wow, like it would be so amazing to be there. Like, what was it? Well, the last time I visited Washington was during that senior year of high school. Um, but other than that, I had no idea like what living in Washington was like at all. Um, so I have no family up here besides a cousin who goes to Seattle U. Nice. Um, yeah, but uh, I think I wanted to stay along the West Coast. And just me visiting Washington before, I was always just kind of open, open to the idea. But I was also looking at other states. Um, such as like Texas and mostly because those states have a lot of hospitals and a lot of residency programs. Um, so what many graduates, new graduates will find is that not every hospital offers a new grad residency program, right? And not every residency program is the same. So, yeah. And are you there alone right now or is there like uh do you have like other people that are like co-workers or anything that are with you at all um right now uh, i'm living in the same area as my girlfriend uh, she works at a different hospital but uh we still work in the same vicinity wow. right up to the tacoma area of yeah. washington mm -hmm. um and then other than that you know i have some friends uh, such as Sammy Kubota or Cassie, hey. um, who, yeah, who live in Seattle. So, which isn't too far away from where I am. It's mm -hmm. about an hour drive. So we see them every now and then. Nice, yeah. nice. Yeah, because I don't know. I feel like a lot of, for a lot of people, you know, everybody kind of, I think in nursing school knows that, you know, there is a chance that we have to go out of state or somewhere just away from the Bay Area to get that first job in new grad. 
but I think a lot of us are very hesitant and scared because it's, you know, a place we've never been, but also because we might have to do it alone. I think that's the biggest fear that a lot of people have, but I think it's good to hear that, you know, you're not doing this all alone, that you have people with you and a strong support system with you, especially now more than ever, right? Which is like the hardest times probably of our lives right now. Right, right. Yeah. And I'm just going to be honest, like when you move to a new place and maybe you don't really know anyone, it can be a little lonely, right? So um, even though that is uh, a lot of new graduates may have to consider going out of state, I can totally understand why they may want to stay in their family or wherever their friends are going. So, um, you know, everyone just has to make their own priorities uh, when looking for jobs and uh, whatever they choose is really just up to them. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you like Seattle right now? Uh, good. I like Seattle. I mean, I'm in like this Tacoma area, which is like, if you're, if you compare Seattle to San Francisco, maybe Tacoma is more like um, San Jose area. Oh, interesting. Right. So that's like the equivalent. Um, but I visit Seattle every now and then just on my days off. It's nice because, right, I don't have any more exams or any more quizzes. Oh. So <laughs> my days off are my days off. So that's really nice. Mm -hmm. um, but that's I am really enjoying nice. the area. It's getting cold out here. So as you can see, I'm wearing like my long sleeves and everything. Um, but <laughs> I definitely have to buy some new jackets because <laughs> the California jackets aren't cutting it. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, I was going to say too. Yeah, because I feel like um us bay area boys i feel like we're used to a certain climate even though it's like kind of weird and inconsistent right now we're used to like a certain temperature and i feel like we're lucky to have but i think it's drastically different if you go anywhere else right oh yeah yeah i mean like right now in washington um the days feel like the coldest days in norcal right so <laughs> so it's only going to get colder from here nice. i i hear there are like snowstorms and blizzards i don't even know so yeah <laughs> oh my god that's crazy but i yeah but i'm just happy that you're not going at it alone and um did you kind of this so i don't know if this is like too personal a question you can like decline if you want but like did you and your girlfriend kind of decide together like to go to like washington was that like a big thing that you guys wanted to do just like this stay like in like the same vicinity of where you worked oh yeah like that was definitely a huge factor when looking um, where we may want to go. Um, like we were looking at places that uh, we had the highest chance of ending up in the same area, right? So mm -hmm. like I said, Washington has a lot of new grad residency programs and then Texas also has a lot of new grad residency programs. And so that's why we were kind of honing in onto those two states at first and then we were gonna look elsewhere, but just the sheer amount of quantity of programs that's what kind of led us here to washington yeah that's yeah. awesome yeah and i'm glad that you guys got to you know stay together and like be in the same apartment that's awesome mm -hmm. yeah yeah totally yeah. <laughs> and when did you start your new grad program like when did you get hired like um and what did you st when did you start yeah so um i graduated in may all right and then um st like right out may 1st that's when they have you start uh, uploading all these documents to USF um, to get to start the process for taking the NCLEX. Mm -hmm. um, and then so while we were waiting for that authorization to take the NCLEX, um, I was actually sending out new grad residency applications. So really, you can start kind of in the middle of your second semester of senior year. Um, yeah, like maybe February even. I didn't start in February. I started like in June, mm -hmm. right? Um, May or June. And then, um, then you probably get the authorization and then you can take, you schedule your test and all, in, all the while you're applying to jobs and doing interviews, you know, now like Zoom calls or phone calls, right? And then I got the job offer in mid-June and then I accepted it. And then I started in August. Wow. Yeah, like mid-August. So it was pretty fast, Yeah. right? Just with all things considered because I had to take the NCLEX at the end of June. So it really only had a month uh, in between the NCLEX and my start date. And then all the while, you're also looking for apartments, place to live, 
um, trying to figure out how you're going to move and all those details. So it was really fast actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it's, yeah. (laughs) How does that, um, so you said you got like the interview and the hiring, like that happened mid June, correct? Mm -hmm, correct. And so what does that mean for, or like the in class like does that mean that you're only hired on a conditional basis like you can't start your job or is it was it kind of was there some pressure like was your job saying like oh if you don't pass it the first time then we might need to move on to someone else like what what was it yeah yeah pretty much um when they hire you they it's a very conditional like we're only going to hire you officially if you can pass your NCLEX right and the thing about applying that some seniors uh, may not know is that you have to apply to take the NCLEX under a certain state so you have to be licensed yeah yeah. uh, under one state so you either choose California or you choose a different state and so that was also a problem that I came across when doing the application process is because when you want to transfer your application because of COVID everything was all backed up right so um, a lot of programs, they want you to have your state license for that specific state by your start date, right? So if I start August 17th in Washington, I need to have my Washington license, yeah. my Washington RN license. But if I t- took the NCLEX under California, it may take two months or three months wow. to transfer it to Washington. And so that may, would make me ineligible to work in the state of Washington for my residency program. So I actually kind of just put all my eggs in one basket and was like, okay, I'm just not even going to take the NCLEX under California. I'm going to take it under Washington. And wow. so, yeah. yeah. Is there like, there's no, but there's no like actual difference in the NCLEX itself, right? It's just like, no. okay. Yeah. I was going to say, but but yeah, good on you. Like, I guess, yeah, that was a big risk, but you know, obviously it, it, you know, worked out well. And I'm glad that, you know, you were able to find a job so quickly and start getting that experience right away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And for those seniors who are saying, oh, well, um, I may have gotten a job offer, but I already scheduled my NCLEX for under California. You just, Um, As a tip, you can actually call the NCLEX, um, I guess, state boards and tell them, hey, I actually want to take the NCLEX for this state, or I want to take it for that state, not California. And you just pay like a little fee, and then you can have it all changed. So that's what I did. I kind of waited for the offer first, and then I switched it from California to take it it under Washington. Okay, nice, nice. That's actually a really good tip. I'm sure that's going to be helpful for the seniors. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 and so it's definitely quite a process, but you know, you get you get through it. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, I know. I just like hearing it from you and Toby and everybody. It just, it sounds, it sounds like there should be like a structure or formula to like just survive and get through it. But like, I think everybody's just gonna struggle through it, no matter how much you know or how much you don't know about the process. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And something I wanna hear about is your road trip to Washington because I understand that that's what you did it wasn't like you just flew over there you kind of made it a thing where like rather than just kind of just moving right away you kind of wanted to see certain things kind of take this last vacation before you had to like go through the grind of your residency program right Mm -hmm. yeah kind of I guess you can say that it was like a family trip I guess you can say Um, it was our family summer trip um, where we kind of all uh, packed everything that we could into my little sedan and then um, all four of us just drove up uh, and we hit um, like Portland and then we kind of stopped in that t- Tacoma apartment area and then visited Seattle for a little bit so it was just nice um, the whole road trip was like two days so it wasn't like super long but uh, just the fact that we were able to sleep over in Portland um, and then kind of um, take our time there was nice so. mm-hmm. and do you feel like the atmosphere environment culture of where you are do you th- like is it different from what it's like in the bay area yeah that's a good that's a good question yeah it's definitely um a little less i guess liberal over here so um actually washington it's like a very good 
mix. I don't know if, if the mix is good or is bad or whatever. It's just a mix, right, of a lot of people who may be a little more conservative and a lot of people who may be liberal. So it's really interesting when I go into work and I hear all these different opinions on all these different, um, I guess, country matters, right, or state matters yeah. even. Um, and so that's really interesting to see, to kind of like the alternate side of maybe what we see in the Bay Area where it's very liberal. And, mm. uh, you know, I would say maybe even the conservative people who may have conservative views are, their voices are a little more suppressed in the Bay Area if they have those type of views. So yeah. that's, an, that's an interesting perspective because I feel like, I don't know, me being someone I feel like who hasn't been outside or kind of had that culture shock yet. I've only been to, you know, been within California and like, las vegas and I, that's not a good um mm-hmm. <laughs> i think that's not like the most represent representative of the entire country and i just wanted to hear from you about that whole thing because i think definitely when you go to another state and then you also pass by oregon too i'm sure that it's you know the i guess the ratio in terms of diversity their opinions their take on everything is going to be different yeah the political climate was definitely something new because when i came here um, a lot of people were like, well, I wouldn't say a lot, but some people, they like drive their trucks around with Trump flags, you know, vote Trump really? 2020. And that's just something you don't see very often in the Bay Area or even just California in general. So um, I wouldn't say I've ever felt um, in danger or um, kind of face any prejudice um, mm-hmm. out here, which is good. But it's just kind of a little culture shock, right, of what I'm used to seeing. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how has, um, how has that move been for you personally? Like, like, um, maybe, I don't know if this is the first time you've been away from home for this extended period of time, but how has it been for you personally? Yeah, for me personally, I think the kind of excitement and adrenaline of first moving to a new state, because this is the first time I'm living in in a different state. Um, it was, it kind of carried me over and I didn't really think much about being away from family or being away from friends. Um, But then now as I'm, as I've been living here for about three months now, now the like homesickness is kind of kicking in and I'm, you know, missing the, you know, the foods and just all the people, right, that um, I'm used to seeing and being around. Uh, But honestly, I think part of it was just an acceptance of like, this is how life is right now, right? I'm kind of understanding the circumstances of COVID and everything. And I think now I'm kind of growing into this like new lifestyle and new life that I'm living. So it, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. it is definitely, it's definitely a process and I'm still like adjusting, but I would definitely say it's, I, I, like, I personally probably need this just to grow a little more. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And like, cause I've never, just um, going through the nursing program, I actually lived with family, right? And um, a lot of things were, like a lot of my living was kind of helped, right? Whether it was with meals or anything. So <laughs> so just even uh, learning how to cook for myself, right? Mm-hmm. Knowing what to cook um, is kind of a learning process in itself. So I'm hanging in there. I'm hanging in there. That's good sure. to hear, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine how hard that must be because I feel like I went through like a mini version of that, even though it's weird to say because my freshman year I did dorm uh, in Hayes, even though I lived in Daly City, which, is you know, it's pretty close to USF. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I felt like I can definitely see what you say in terms of like um, taking that um, jump to kind of – I guess, enhance or just ignite that personal growth. Cause I felt like me being at home and me, I've been at home for the past 18 years of my life and then suddenly changing my entire environment. And I guess in a way, even though I guess I had friends, it was kind of my first time alone. And I think when it is your first time alone, that's really when you have time to do more introspection. And I guess in a way, find yourself. And I think I was able to get that freshman year. I don't know if you were able to do uh, get the same experience in college, but I'm really glad that you're getting that chance right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I also lived in the dorms. It's very similar. Um, you know, the learning curve is very similar. And so, um, but I'm sure, you know, as you were going through your own dorm life, right, like you kind of adjusted to it. And 
um, yeah. maybe even start enjoying it, huh? <laughs> oh, oh, for sure. Because, yeah, cause like uh, when I started the, the dorm life, I actually um, every weekend I would still come back home. And, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, cause yeah. I didn't. Yeah, cause like I didn't want to pay for laundry, so I did my laundry at home. You know, I just yeah. I slept at home every week. But I think when it got towards the latter half of freshman one and then into freshman two, I kind of went home less because I felt like I was gaining that independence and was able to, I guess, handle it. Because I think in the beginning I probably couldn't handle it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, totally. I mean, that's also just being smart on money, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember um, my first week of living in the dorms freshman year, I didn't know how to do laundry. Like, mm-hmm. I didn't know what to separate, what to, what kind of soap I needed. And so I remember FaceTiming my mom and being like, okay, what, how do I do this laundry? And so it was just, it was, it was funny. It was funny. Yeah. And I don't know if it's the same experience for you, but I, something that I found that maybe a lot of people who are watching this podcast right now that can, uh, relate with is even though somehow that you guys don't see your family as much you still don't see your high school friends as much some t- somehow it's some in a way you kind of get closer to them I think in a way you're valuing them more because you're not always seeing them you're not in a way taking them for granted I don't know if that's the same for you yeah I mean even with this um COVID uh, I haven't been able to see my childhood friends that I normally get to see on the longer breaks right like during the school year and so um, it just kind of makes you put in a little more effort than what you may, right? Like a different kind of effort, you know? And so whether that's, you know, texting or calling or um, I guess DMing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's definitely a different type of effort, but you're right. It totally makes you appreciate them even more, right? Yeah, man. I don't know. It's, I think it's so weird, even though we're like seven months into this whole pandemic, I think it's just, I think a lot of people, including myself, are struggling to do that, like putting in that effort, because usually, you know, you see them when you're on campus, or you're, they just yeah. live close to you, and like, you're shooting the shit, like, hey, what's up, how you been, and then all of a sudden, now it's just like this huge pause on everything, but I think right. what you said was very good in that, you, you, in a way, you have to put in that new kind of effort in order to, you know, continue that friendship, whether it's going to grow or not, just to continue it. Because, you know, I think it's never really that healthy to put a friendship on pause. Right. Yeah, I know. Definitely. I mean, kind of what you were saying, it's like your friends, maybe because of convenience, right? Just because you're in the same area or you're in the same program. So it really um, makes you think about, uh, you know, who you really want to give your time to and things yeah. like that. But, you know, how, how are you doing with, with that socially um, with like during this time? I, I assume it's pretty tough just because the nursing program's really busy and everything. Yeah. Um, I think for me personally, it's, it's very, very hard. Cause I think I'm the type of person where I kind of grind, like my priority is always school for probably like five to six days out of the week and then I take that one to two days to be with high school friends or my current USF friends and because I don't have that now and it's kind of forcing me to do it through online it's it's hard especially because I uh, the things we did was mainly um, hanging out going out getting food or playing sports that was like the biggest thing we did but obviously we just can't do that now right right yeah bummer that's that's a bummer yeah Yeah, (laughs) I mean like even even for me I mean uh even if I even if I have friends in the area or if I want to see families I just me being in the um health field it's kind of I'm hesitant right um so I'm sure that's probably even what some people feel going to clinical sometimes it's just the fact that they're in the hospital even if it's once once a week Mm -hmm. right it can be kind of concerning yeah. And how's that going for you? Like, I guess, you know, when you did start your residency program and moving forward to now, like, do you like, how have your coworkers been? And do you feel like it's hard to make that connection initially? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I guess whenever you're put in a new environment, it always takes some time to warm up to. But I mean, I've been fortunate enough where um, all my coworkers are really nice. Um, I haven't really felt uh the, the phrase, um, you know, nurses eat their young. That's good. That's so, good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's, I'm just a little lucky, but, uh, I'm sure there are cases elsewhere as well where, so, um, 
I think it's just if you spend the time to get to know people and you just introduce yourself uh, right from the get go and you don't just kind of brush over them until you need something from them, right? Um, that's that's. Sorry, uh, a little bit of te technical difficulties. So yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, sorry about that technical difficulties. But yeah, Nathan, you were uh, talking about um, how fortunate you are that you know you haven't really experienced that kind of rumor or you know fear that everyone has of like the new grads getting eaten by their you know by like the older and more experienced nurses. You know. Right. Yeah, and I think um, part of it is just you have to be friendly. You have to put yourself out there just by like introducing yourself. Right. That doesn't mean you have to be an extrovert, extroverted person. Um, you just have to be friendly, introduce yourself to your CNAs, your nurses, um, your managers, um, just saying hello and getting that foundation there. That's really important to really um, make your life a lot easier um, in the long run. So. Yeah, but I feel like something that I imagine is that um, you guys start building that rapport and that interpersonal relationship, maybe outside of the hospital. I feel like that's how kind of where things kind of get closer, where like, usually it's like, Hey, you know, with your coworkers, Hey, do you want to go grab a bite to eat? Or you want to go to the bar or something like that. But unfortunately I feel like it might be harder for you guys to do that because of what's happening right now. Right. Yeah. It definitely makes it a little harder. Um, people, um, I guess, yeah, I'm more hesitant to go out. And then also something that's interesting is a lot of my coworkers are like married or have kids. Oh, wow. Um, and so they have their, a life of their own where um, after the 12 hour shift, they have other responsibilities, right? True, where true, yeah. they're not asking to go out to the bars or anything <laughs> or restaurants. Um, so, but also just depends on the type of unit you work on and the hospital, right? Like different hospitals have different age spectrums. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's, that's the difference is that I'm kind of very young compared to all my coworkers where mm -hmm. I think I may actually be the youngest. Oh, wow. And yeah. Yeah. And, um, so. Just to like clarify or just uh, make sure that people know you're in the um, adult oncology, correct? Right. Yeah. I'm doing adult med surge oncology right now. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like maybe why you got into it and just what it's been like since you started as a new grad? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, during my USF clinical rotations, I actually had the opportunity to work on a um, hematology oncology floor and a med surge oncology floor. And I've actually really liked both. Um, I like the pace of it and I like the patient population. Um, it's always interesting to see kind of how patients see, you know, their own diagnoses, right? Um, and their kind of prognosis and how they deal with that. And so I actually really wanted an oncology job. And so I was really, um, you know, happy to see that uh, I got that. And um, right now my floor is kind of split in half, half, right? Half of it is just general med surge where you're seeing a lot of people with wounds, um, a lot of congestive heart failure, um, things like that. And then the other side, a lot of people are dealing with different types of cancers, whether it's solid um, or blood cancers. Um, and so a lot of people have like palate cancers or just cancer, yeah, just cancers anywhere else in the body. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that sounds heavy. And how do you, have you had any like difficulties or like just in general, how do you approach that? Like maybe a patient who just recently got that diagnosis, like how, like how as like you as a nurse, how, what do you do kind of after they get that diagnosis? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just, um, you know, kind of what USF teaches is just practice empathy, you know, tell, use that therapeutic communication because, that stuff actually works, you know? <laughs> I mean, I mean, if you say it like a robot, it's not gonna work, right? But I mean, you actually have to mean it as well. And, um, and really try and take the time to be there for your patient and with your patient. Um, I, I worked day shift for about two months and then they recently moved me to night shift. And the difference between that is that day shift, you're just really busy. You really sometimes don't have the time to do that, honestly. Um, but night shift on, um, I recently just started that, uh, sometimes you do have that time. And so I think that's when you really have to make the extra effort um, mm -hmm. to talk with your patients. Because what I found is that a lot of patients are really lonely. 
you know, they're not talking about their pets or their chickens to you. That's a real story that actually happened. They're so telling me about their chickens um, because they just love their chickens so much. I mean, I, that's probably part of it, but also just because they want someone to talk to you because when you're in there for a long time in the hospital and in that hospital bed, um, you know, um, you just want someone to talk to you and, you know, it can get very fatiguing when people just run in and back and forth, um, giving you shots, giving you medication, taking you here, taking you there. So um, when you do have a moment um, to really help a patient, they really appreciate it most of the time, most of the time. Most of the time. <laughs> yeah, I feel like, man, yeah, I know. Like that kind of just reminded me of just how we were talking about, you know, me or like me asking you, like, what is it like if, you know, people out there as a new grad, they're going to be all alone, isolated as a new grad, you know, in a different state maybe. But then I can't imagine what it's like for the patients going through, you know, what they're going through with their prognosis. And on top of that, maybe not having that support system, like some of us are fortunate to have, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, a lot of patients are total care, they're bed bound. And so it's not like they have their independence that they may be used to before they were admitted. Um, and so even for them, it's a shock and um, they're adjusting to it as well as they can. Uh, so, you know, as, as a nurse, it's really important to um, reassure them, uh, not false reassurance, but just reassure them that you're listening and that, you know, you are being their advocate. That's really important. Mm -hmm. and that you are passing on the information that's necessary to the next nurse or to your assistant, right? Nursing assistant. And you mentioned that you have been on, you know, the unit as day shift for two months, and then you got converted into, or like transitioned into night shift. So that means you're on your own now, right? Like you're, you're kind of done with being with a preceptor. You're kind of just been on your own for a while now, right? Um, actually my residency program is about three months and I'm oh, contracted okay. for 15 months. So I still have a preceptor right now, but okay. I'm pretty much taking full responsibility of a full patient load, which is five for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's that like? Like, you know, cause I know, I feel like in a way throughout clinicals at USF, even from maybe a little bit of your capstone, I feel like, you know, you're doing a lot, but I think there is like kind of a bigger safety net and a way like you're kind of still holding that hand of the nurse that you're with. But what is it like kind of having that um, entire patient ratio and then caring for everyone? What is that like? Oh, man, like the first couple of shifts or weeks, um, you're just super nervous, right? Taking on that responsibility because when people want answers, they go to the nurse, which is you, right? Not your preceptor. <laughs> so uh, it's definitely um, makes you stay on top of your stuff, right? Whether it's um, staying up to date on what happened to your patient overnight or what's happening now. Um, and that really forces you to stay in touch with the other members of the care team. Um, but it's totally different from Capstone. I mean, even in Capstone, even if you take the responsibility, you know, of a patient or multiple patients, most of the time you're still kind of following the nurse or uh, the nurse is following you, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. you are a student and there is that liability, you know, so um, definitely a lot more responsibility. But um, I think after you start working a couple months, you do get more comfortable as you learn, you know. Uh, as you learn, because when you go in um, on the first day, you know nothing. You know, you may have your clinical book knowledge, right? But other than that, you don't have any of the skills. You're not fast at anything. You're slow in everything, yeah. um, in all honesty. And then but as the weeks go on, you get faster and you're not, you're thinking less about how you're going to pass the medication and more about why you're passing this medication or nice. um, what's next for this patient. So, I mean, nursing is just a profession of repetition, I feel. Um, yeah. Or that's not all of it, but that is, it's a big, it's a large part of it. You need the repetition. Oh yeah. Good. I a I hundred percent agree with uh, what you said. I feel like something you said like, that was like super, super important that I agree with was kind of, uh, you kind of have to learn how to, how to actually do it first and keep repeating and repeating before you can kind of critically think uh, critically think about other things surrounding surrounding it especially um administering medication like for me like I, i'm super nervous still like i haven't had enough practice so the whole time i'm just thinking oh shoot which med am i gonna give what time how am i gonna 
do the actual medication mm-hmm. administration but i feel like you know hopefully with repetition i'm able to think like think outside like oh like um i have to make sure about the, even though i still do it now but i think i'll like with repetition i'll better able to recognize like the contraindications uh just the purpose and just better medication education you know in the future mm-hmm. yeah i know totally i mean heck the part some of the hardest parts of uh, medication administration is learn learning how to open the medication itself from the packaging just because there's so many different types of packaging oh yeah um, yeah right so i mean uh like I wouldn't say I was very confident as a nursing student. I mean, to be honest, I kind of went into clinicals super nervous every night before I went into clinical, just because, um, I don't know, for me, it was like, since I pre-labbed, I felt the responsibility to know everything, even though I really didn't. And um, I don't know, kind of like, that kind of all changed when I started working as, you know, because it's like, well, I'm just going to go in, you know, with no idea what's going to happen, but it's, it's going to happen. Right. And you're going to yeah. be there. So. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like part of that too, of you becoming more comfortable is, is with that repetition. Cause I think when we had clinical at most, we were having it like once a week or something, but like me right now as a junior one, I'm having it twice a week, but I feel like, you know, I don't think that's not enough to start becoming comfortable and confident really you know I think I, I was in that same boat as you were like every night before I had to start clinical I was super super anxious because I didn't know anything to be honest mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah but I think it's good that you're getting that repetition and slowly being comfortable with being uncomfortable mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah definitely I mean when you're a nursing student you just not in, you're just not in charge of you know calling people you're not in charge of having the phone on you all the time and um, once you once you start that in your actual profession um, or actual career I should say um, that just all gets easier as time goes on so I mean if you're a nursing student right now and you're just thinking oh my gosh nothing's clicking for me um, I don't really understand what's going on I'm not fast enough I mean that will all be solved as long as you stay with it and keep Um, being persistent with what you're doing and as long as you care for the patient i mean everything else will fall into place and how has um specifically med surge been for you because i i've heard a lot of stuff how like message med surge is like an amazing way to learn time management organizational skills but with that i i I assume that there's a huge learning curve and difficulties in the beginning because it's kind of in a way um what from what i've heard kind of like a silent chaos. I feel like I, 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 I think of like the ER, or like the ice, like the ER is kind of like the loud chaos and everything's just fumbling around. Everyone's um, going about it, but it's controlled. And I kind of think of med surge as like a silent chaos where no one's like really screaming, but you can tell like there's a lot of stuff going out, going on at once. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's a good way of describing it. Silent chaos. I kind of like that. Um, (laughs) But it's so true. I mean, during day shift, you have maybe up to five patients, depending where you are um, or where you work. And um, although the skills may not be tough, such as passing meds, um, it's just everything that's happening in the day that makes it really tough on you to complete your tasks, right? So if you have doctors calling you, you have patients' family calling you, you have members of the other of the care team calling you all for five patients. I mean, it it is really overwhelming sometimes. I mean, I've been running, <laughs> like to be honest, I've been running some some shifts depending on um, on how hard the patient load is. But um, it it can be really busy. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, I mean, that be that being said, though, um, it does help you with your time management. Like you really it forces you to cluster your care. And, you know, you'll hear a lot about that in nursing school. It's like cluster your care, cluster this. And, and it's, it's really true, you know, so yeah. <laughs> you find a, you, you find a way to, to deal with it. So. Oh my God. Thank you. There's hope for us yet guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think I like um, what you kind of mentioned, how there is a distinct difference in a way between like day shift and night shift and how now that you're at night shift, because everything's a little bit more quiet you have that a little bit more time to be with the patients and kind of connect with them more because I think that's truly what they need 
especially with COVID going on and because of, you know, having cancer. I think it's super, super important to have or allow them to have that connection beyond just themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, you know, let's be, I guess, be clear on this, that night shift isn't easy. I know that's going to take off a lot of night shifts because 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 I've only worked on it for like a week. So Mm -hmm. um, it could have just been a one-time thing, but Mm -hmm. um, it can get really crazy on night shift just because you don't have all those resources available during the days, such as like IV teams and um, other type of therapists. But um, yeah, I mean, the night shift job is just just as important to the total care of a patient. I mean, because when you're a day shift nurse, sometimes it can be really tough to really get into a patient's chart, especially when you have multiple, right? To look into and you have all these meds to give. And so when you are a night shift nurse and you have the time, um, or if you have the time, your job is to to dive deep into all those notes and pass it on to the day nurse. Um, So it really is a team effort, even though it seems like, okay, here's this patient and then, okay, good luck with your shift, right? It really is important to um, continue that care by looking through those notes on on nights. And how has that been for you, like reading those notes? Because I know that, you know, um, a patient is, you know, more than just their symptoms. So yes, they have cancer, but you also get a chance to read about their psychosocial history in the charts and everything going on with their lives. Like if they chose to choose to tell you as well, like how does that affect you? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, when you are really able to dive deep into those notes, I think you kind of get a better understand a foundation um, or understanding of the patient um, themselves, kind of like what, because it's not just all about their diagnosis. A part of it is just what are their preferences for where they want to go after their discharge, right? What are their preferences for um, living? What are their uh, religious beliefs, right? Because chaplain services sees patients sometimes. And so I think looking through those notes first and then trying to con- use those notes to connect with the patient is really important like oh I heard you like this right or I heard you want to go here after um so it's it's really important to to read through those notes and um really see the patient like you said um just as a full person because it can it can be um hard sometimes when you have so many things going through your head right you're trying to process so much information um but it also helps you with your care when you are able to look through those notes right because instead of you know, um, I guess assuming respirations are 16, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you actually are like, oh yeah, they actually have a history of being short of breath, right? Um, and that really helps you and all your assessments um, and understanding what their baseline is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And personally for you, do you feel like, um, are you scared of having that desensitization or like disconnect from your patients like maybe like through burnout like do you feel like you're getting there in a way yeah I mean unfortunately nurses are just overworked I mean a lot of people who work in the hospital are overworked whether it's the CNAs the nurses the doctors I mean there is a lot of autonomy in nursing um in regards to what you can do but then also there are a lot of people above you that are also still controlling kind of how you do things, what you have to do. Um, And so there can be that burnout where you feel like the middle man as a nurse, where you do have to manage, you know, you do have to make sure the medication is okay for the patient, even though the doctor prescribed it. You do have to make sure that your nursing assistant did the job or the task that you said that they had to do. You do have to make sure that the PT or OT is going to your patient's room today, right? So it is just a lot of coordination um, and it can lead to burnout. And I mean, after working, you know, a full week, um, just any, any week, um, it's, you're tired and you're using your days off to recover. So, (laughs) so I I can see why a lot of nurses burn out. Um, But it's, I guess it's important, like that self-care aspect of things, whether it's, um, you know, social self-care or just even just resting and decompressing rest uh, self-care. So just whatever, yeah, whatever works for you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I, I wanted to ask you specifically because I know that, you know, being in adult oncology, like um, caring for people with cancer, um, because, you know, because I think everyone, whether you're in nursing, whether you're in medical field or not, you know that cancer is could be very deadly. And, you know, I think it's like the second or third deadliest thing in, like that's killing people right now. Well, not right now, but yeah, you know what I mean? But mm-hmm. yeah, so I think that can be a super heavy thing to go into every day, like for work, to see these patients that are going through this, such a difficult time. And, you know, we want to care for them, but I think there's always this concern that we're never taking care of ourselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, the work can be really heavy. I haven't, um, I guess, been on a shift where someone has died on um, my watch or just during the shift. So I can't speak to that. But I mean, just listening to patients' perspectives on their own diagnoses, like maybe they're at the end stage, right? Or they should, maybe their health trajectory is saying, oh, they should be on hospice, something like that, right? But they're kind of refusing it and they're very optimistic. It's, um, I guess, a nurse's job not to try and change their perspective, but just kind of roll with them. And that can be tough sometimes because, you know, you sometimes you just want them to understand what you're seeing, right? Um, but it's that's why you need to kind of rely on friends, rely on family, whether that's calling them um, and kind of venting sometimes, right? Um, sometimes you may not even think it's really bogging you down, but then once you start talking about it, it's like a snowball effect, right? Yeah. Where just one thing leads to the other. And um, yeah, it's really important to uh, understand and be... I guess, mindful of what really helps you kind of recover from, from that mentally and physically. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm really glad that, you know, you're, you're so self-aware and you're able to recognize that, you know, beyond nursing, you do need a support system because, you know, as scary as, you know, the thought is to take care of these patients who may potentially die and have these, you know, very serious prognosis. I think what's something that's scarier for us nurses is that we stop caring at all. I think that's like the biggest thing. And I think it's really good that you recognize your coping mechanisms and ways that you're able to continue being passionate and genuine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely when you're busy, it's, it's hard sometimes to really like see, um, see your patient beyond the diagnosis or beyond the tasks that you have to do for them. Um, but I mean, it's always just taking a break, right? You taking breaks are really important in nursing. Um, and any seasoned nurse will tell you that like, you should take your break. Right. Um, and things like that, um, where you can really decompress and kind of assess what you're feeling and how you're kind of seeing your own patients. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, burnout is a real thing in nursing. It's, um, yeah, people feel it, <laughs> whether you're actually burnt out or um, in going there, right? It, it, it's a real concern sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, like you said about the breaks, I like I emphasize that for just like in nursing school too, like take your breaks. I feel like, especially when we're at clinical, you know, maybe just once or twice a week, like you kind of make it a thing where you don't sometimes want to take your break. You want to keep pushing, just either get that experience or just always just be in there. But I think, you know, I'm able to do that now because I've, I'm only at clinical for one to two times a week, but then I can't imagine going through like three days straight, not taking a break. I don't think that would be very healthy for me at all. Yeah, no, I mean, if you don't take your breaks, you're not eating and body or your mind so um, it gets really tough Mm -hmm. and how um i'm curious because i don't think i've ever asked like then my new grad friends yet but like how has it been not oh maybe you haven't experienced it yet but are you like kind of worried because you don't get that summer or like winter break anymore now you kind of have to just like continuously keep working and working have little breaks here and there like are you kind of worried about (laughs) not having those big breaks anymore uh yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, actually, I kind of thought about this recently, where it's like, man, I don't know when I'm going to be able to go back and see my family, right? Not only because of the profession that I'm in, but just because of scheduling, right? Um, and then you have to take time off and things like that. So that's more of my biggest concern with not having those breaks is really not being able to spend time with your family or friends like you want to, or that you're used to. Um, 
but I mean, fortunately uh, for all nurses, they kind of have a little more flexibility depending on kind of what organization they work in, right? Because typically, proportionally, I work maybe three days a week, right? Whether that's three days straight or just spread out. So um, I guess I guess it's kind of working with your schedulers to make that a little easier on, on yourself. Yeah, like, because I think when I view summer break or winter break, I kind of like when I'm like in the midst of like midterm season finals or whatever, like I kind of see winter break and summer as like my goal. Like I'm going to work my ass off yeah. so that I can like get to winter break and summer break, go on vacation or just like be lazy and like be okay with being lazy. But I think um, now that you, you know, don't have those summer winter breaks anymore, I think it's more important now more than ever that, you know, you have those little breaks. Cause I think those little breaks probably do add up and do kind of contribute to your positive outcome in the end. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think they kind of balance each other out because like you said, when you're in school, you're looking towards that break. You're not looking towards your weekend. You're looking towards your break. Mm -hmm. Right. But when you're working, um, your days off are, are pretty much your days off unless you have other important responsibilities that you have. But, um, you know, so I think it's just kind of, I'm still getting used to like seeing my days off as, oh, it's okay to not do anything, right? Or it's okay to just I don't know, run errands, do, mm -hmm. do boring stuff during the day, right? Yeah. You don't always have to be productive, always doing something. And I think that's something that um, I'm still getting used to because during nursing school, I was always like, okay, this test is coming up. I got to study for this, or I have this quiz coming up gotta study for this you know there's there was no free time or you had to really make a concerted effort to, to have it yeah yeah like that's yeah I totally agree with that because I'm kind of going through that now where in a way I feel like I'm not too busy but I think I'm just too scared to take a break because mm -hmm. I think that is like the culture of nursing. I always say that in these podcasts, like the culture of nursing is something. <laughs> but it's kind of true where you kind of, there is this expectation uh, that you should always be grinding. You should always be working to do well, whether it's your extracurriculars or just your nursing class itself. Like it, the grind never stops, you know, the same. But like, I think that's something that we need to change starting in nursing school that you know whether it's just like once a week or just some time within the week you should have a time to take a break because you know if you don't have any breaks at all that's gonna those are gonna add up and then cause you to probably potentially burn out right yeah i mean totally i mean if i were to have a regret um at all during the nursing program it would just be that i didn't take enough of those breaks right because i mean if that test is so important to you you're gonna study for it no matter what right um, so might as well take the break and enjoy a little time to yourself and then study after, right? It's kind of understanding your priorities and knowing that, um, no matter what you do now, you're still always going to study to try and be as prepared as you can be for that test coming up or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And like, and it's weird now cause I'm still in nursing school, but I feel like that's a big regret that I had especially freshman year or like in part of sophomore year where, um, you know, coming out of high school, there was, you know, expectation that, Oh, I got to go, go, go. This is my first year of nursing school. I got to grind super hard in microbiome and all that, which I did. And yes, I did well, but at the same time, looking back, I sacrificed a lot of time with my friends and family to do well. And even though I'm glad that I, you know, I got that a in microbiome, I think I would have, you know, I would have sacrificed a little bit more if it meant that I kind of had more to remember freshman year. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, I totally agree. Totally agree with that statement. I mean, um, like even in senior year, um, I was looking forward to finishing the HESI, right. The last HESI. Yeah. So I kind of like dropped everything, all types of communication kind of right with um, anyone socially and then just studied a whole month and a half straight for HESI. And then I was like, okay, cool. After HESI, then I can do all those fun things, right? Then I can start going to play basketball or whatever it may be. And then that's when COVID hit and none of that ever happened. And so I was left with finishing HESI, which is awesome. It's a great feeling, but then you, didn't get that other half that would have maybe fulfilled you 
and gone the other way so yeah yeah I also had a similar experience with that with like uh, you had your exit HESI and I had my uh, soft two HESI where I think um, I think for th- like three weeks or two weeks before the HESI, I just grinded super hard, like literally like 10 hours a day studying and I um, no communication. And I then that's like when I after that, that's when I like felt true burnout, not just because it was just so hard on my body, but also I think burnout comes from um the um, like your I guess your rewards versus your work input they don't align which it didn't for me because like you said you you always hope like oh I'm gonna go play basketball hang out with my friends after but boom COVID you can't by the way <laughs> yeah and <laughs> yeah yeah so I think in that I've kind of learned to kind of sprinkle the good things in life in between all the struggles because I don't think you should ever put uh put off time for the good stuff later because you never know what's going to happen later all you know is now so you might as well enjoy a little bit of stuff right now and everything along the way yeah no it's definitely a balance i mean it's a balance i mean you should be working hard right i mean nursing is a tough profession that you need to know your stuff so um work hard but then also um you know make time make time for other things that are important to you as well Mm -hmm. yeah and i know as for me it's like I'm always thinking of that um, time, like once I do graduate and I get that new grad job, I'm going to be so happy that I don't have to do, you know, study and stuff or do exams and all that on my free time. But, you know, it's kind of, it's crazy to see, to hear that, you know, you, you're having a hard time adjusting because, you know, nursing school taught you to always be on that grind, but now you're kind of having some difficulties allowing yourself to be relaxed and be free during your off days. Right. Yeah. And just to add to that, I mean, if you don't invest in yourself during your college years, right, or if you don't explore things during your college years, then when you have your days off as a new grad or um, just during your career, sometimes you don't know what to do. Right? That's a good because point. Because you, you don't know if you like rock climbing or you don't know if you like this or that. Right. Um, and so I think it's makes it a little harder to start those, I guess, hobbies or extracurriculars that you like and enjoy um, after you graduate. So just a heads up to all those that are in the middle of it or just starting it, um, make time to explore different things and try to try them out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do, is that like a difficulty that you're having right now? Or like, do you have like specific hobbies that you kind of do on your off days? Yeah. I mean, at first I didn't really know what to do, but then I kind of started, um, like saying, okay, what were some stuff I like doing? Maybe, um, I wanted to read more. I'm not much of a reader, but I feel like (laughs) I should start reading. And so I started reading. Um, I started working out again, right. Cause once COVID hit all the gyms closed and I was like kind of half committed to it, right. Half committed to my, um, physical health. And, but now I'm back, uh, back pretty consistently, Uh, with my physical health and I think that's super important is that um, uh, when you're working um, you have a very balanced lifestyle of whether it's working on your physical health or your mental health whatever that may be yeah yeah and I think um, I don't know I can't emphasize enough how important exercise and you know, working at working out all the outdoor activities that you do. I think those are super important because those don't only contribute to your physical health, but I really do. I'm a firm believer that it helps with your mental health. Cause I think um, for me personally, are you frozen? Are you good? Okay. Sorry. I thought you were frozen for a second, but I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, but yeah, good. like for me personally, I think me playing sports is the only real time where I'm able to like live in the moment and be present and not have to worry about school. Like I, like it took me a while to realize it again, but like today I went out for a run again, like um, on my track, like did like the same workouts that I used to do in high school. And in that moment when I was like in such pain and like I was threw up because I was like running super hard, that's when I felt like I was in the moment. That was the only, and I wasn't worried about school. And I think I, I don't suggest like running as hard as I, as I did, but I suggest that you go out, do some sports, do something that you love so that you're focused on that and having that time for your brain and your body to recover from school. 
Yeah, totally. I mean, get out of the house, right? I mean, walk around a trail, walk around a park, walk around the mall. I mean, just any type of physical activity just kind of keeps you refreshed that I've, I've noticed. Mm -hmm. And where you're living right now, like in the Tacoma area, like is that kind of similar to the SF vibes where it's like a major city or is it more of kind of like suburbs? Like what, what kind of area are you living in? Um, the area I'm living in is definitely more suburban. Yeah, I mean, my hospital is in a suburban area. So um, not a whole lot of, I guess, what you see in San Francisco, like not a lot of trendy restaurants or um, trendy activities, I guess you can say. But I mean, when you're working and everything, <laughs> you, you really just need the basic suburban necessities, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, at least for me, that's kind of what works for me. I know some people, they really enjoy getting the most out of the city, right? So it just depends on, on your own personality. Mm -hmm. True, true. Yeah. I'm always curious. Like, I always ask people that, like, oh, are you, like, a city person or a suburbs person? Because, like, me, myself, I'm definitely, like, a suburbs person. Like, I've lived in the suburbs my whole life, and I, I kind of have this idea in my mind where, like, wherever I go as a new grad, like, of course, I, like, to say the Bay Area, but realistically, I might have to go elsewhere. But I, I'm like, yo, if, at least if I have like a Costco or a Target or something, I'll be good, you know? <laughs> yeah, definitely Costco. I mean, this my whole place is like Costco stuff, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish it. It's just too much. <laughs> yes, I know. That's always the thing with Costco. Like I just buy so much cause, like in the moment, whether I'm like hungry or not, I think like, oh, you know, I'll be able to finish this. One or two weeks later, like, oh, it's spoiled. Like I throw it out. Yeah, or you just get tired of it. I mm -hmm. I don't I won't be able to finish seventy granola bars. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you mentioned that um, it's been such a new experience for you living on your own, away from your family, because uh, because you know you were with them for a majority of time. I guess your whole life, right? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. yeah, how has that been? I know you touched on that a little bit about like cooking and stuff, but how has that been just living on your own? Yeah, um, I guess it's not too bad. I didn't visit my family much, um, like during my weekends when I was in college. So it's not too different. Um, it's just, hmm, I haven't really thought about that. What does that feel like? But um, it, it's not too bad because you're just busy with, um, you know, with all your own responsibilities and with work. Um, it's just make sure I just make sure to always make time to call my family. Um, like after I finish a shift, right. Um, if I finish at 7 PM, uh, then I just call them on my way back home. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have to do this full like FaceTime call. That's two hours long. It's really just a five, 15 minute call. And that, that to me is really worthwhile and keeps people updated and, you know, makes, makes you feel like you're still, um, being thought of or and it makes them think that you're still thinking of them so it, it, it's a it's nice that's awesome that's awesome and um since you've kind of started this or you since you started being in this whole new environment and um transition to a very important and new part of uh, new part of your life like do you ever kind of miss college or do you have certain things that you miss about college hmm. yeah I, I just miss all the people I miss all the people. I mean, right now, there are a lot of people who are getting jobs out of state or just um, in different areas all, all across the country. Um, and there are still people who don't have jobs right now, but um, still, I'm away from them. And um, it's kind of interesting to them, seeing them start their own life. Uh, and it's, that just makes a point that it's even more important to stay in touch. Mm -hmm. yeah and it, it just goes back to your point in the beginning about like effort uh you know you can't just see them on campus again you kind of have to like if you really do want to maintain this friendship and you have to prioritize it and get put in that effort or to like allow it to grow mm, yeah totally totally yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so maybe as like a closing statement do you have any advice for um the people, the nursing students right now going through this difficult time of like what they can do, whether it's about friendships or classes, do you have any advice for them? Um, 
uh, I say just enjoy the time that you have right now in college, whether um, you know, no matter how stressed you are, um, just know that it's a, you're in a very special program. Um, I know that a lot of people, a lot of my coworkers right now, they only have their associates right now. And so, oh, you frozen? Oh, I'm not frozen. Okay, cool. I'm just like okay, really cool, still. Cool, cool. I'm like listening. Okay. So I'm just like really still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, just enjoy your time. I mean, um, enjoy the program that you're in. Enjoy the people that you're around as much as you can, uh, because it does. It does. Life gets busy. Um, and so, what else? I want to say something else. Um, what else? I'm just going to stretch this out, you know, yeah, but, no worries, no, no worries, no worries um, at all. but, uh, yeah, do just explore, try new things. I think that's really important, um, during this time. Um, and yeah, yeah, you, you guys are, I know as we're in this program, it feels like everyone's on a fast track to life. Right. I, I still talk to a lot of people in the nursing program right now and, you know, they have all their um, um, career ambitions and that's great. You need those um, to go far in life. Um, but um, also understand that it's a process, right? And to get where you want to be, you have to be patient. Um, you know, uh, I know a lot of people who didn't get uh, the unit that they had originally wanted um, right out of nursing school. Um, but if, the, if it's that important to you, you're going to get there. Um, I just know it, right? And so it's just staying patient and uh, continue just working on yourself because when you do that, uh, then that, that will really translate into your patient care because if you love what you do, uh, it'll show and your patients are really going to appreciate it. So yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. That's all I got. Well said though. Well, well said. That was <laughs> like actually really, really good advice. I really appreciate you saying that. And you know, um what, what do i usually do i always now nowadays i like to shout out special shout out to the people that stayed to the end of the podcast and watched the whole thing love you all keep doing that and shout yeah. out to you yes yes and thank you again nathan for being on the podcast i really appreciate it and i know a lot of the viewers do too sure my pleasure i was super excited when you invited me because i've been watching your other ones um, i was like oh that's so cool but <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah thank you for having me i really appreciate it Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, you know, everyone make sure to like and subscribe, all that jazz. And we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. See ya.